Hans Alvin, that's how you pronounce his name. Yeah. Yeah. So brilliant guy, right? From like the 19, was he primarily like doing the, the peak of his work in the 50s, the 1950s or so? Yeah. Like early, like 40s started coming on and then 50s, 60s, 70s, and then wrote a lot of good stuff, like summary kind of work in the 80s. Oh, okay. And then um, seemed to, maybe he passed on in the 90s. I think it was the 90s. He may have passed away, 80s. Okay. Don't know exact life, okay. but um, so, 1995 is when he passed. Okay, so he um, he 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 was. You you, you got to kind of maybe mention a little bit about who he is and and the way that he thought because he was he brought plasma into the 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 conversation in a much bigger way than Einstein or anybody prior to his time really did and. It's like plasma is like 99.9% of the universe. It's almost everything that we can see out there is is plasma and and the way that plasma interacts with electromagnetism and just, you know, the like it's just it it's it seems like it's such a huge part of the equation plasma. I really want to get into it more on the show and and educate myself and educate other people about plasma and what it is and how it works, but but what was Hans Alvin's kind of what was his grand model for um, reality, and how did plasma play a role in that? Um, well, yeah, so he spent a lot of time just kind of doing thought experimentation on the cosmos and the structure of the cosmos. And he has a fantastic book that I recommend everyone read. It's pretty expensive now because I think it's out of print or it's like limited print, uh, but called Cosmic Plasma. It's like 150 pages, but it's like dense in a good way. Dense in a way that, make, at least for me, it popped me out to like space every single time I read a new page. And I spent a lot of time, it took me a while to read through it, but I was also had so many new insights that came to me. Uh, but he has a whole bunch of other books too. You could find these PDFs perhaps, and even if if you don't want to devote the time to, um, to reading them, you could load them into Notebook LM and have it generate some podcasts for you using those sources. You listened to a couple that I made and you found them quite nice. I, I think they're fantastic. I think yep. it's one of the best AI tools that we do have um, that's reasonable. But there, there seems to be a better understanding of plasma from these people that were born in Northern Europe. Like um, uh, Birkeland, I mean, he was seen the Aurora all the time, right? And he came up with, uh, an idea of what they actually were, and it wasn't until decades after that people were like, "Oh, Birkeland is right," and he developed the idea of Birkeland currents, and now we have observational evidence of that. And uh, Hans Alvin's from Sweden, and there's a personal synchronicity I have with him. Like I'm in San Diego right now, and I bought this book, and then I find out it comes from the he he was coordinating with like the University of San, San Diego in La Jolla, which is right basically right where I am. And the book actually was from like the La Jolla like library. It's like, oh, so like little synchronicities like that tell me I'm pointing, like I'm in the right direction. Um, so there's some resonance that seems to exist between these people that are like there all the time, witnessing these things and understanding it, which makes sense to me. The more you're focusing on something, the more you're gonna get from it. And uh, he just did a really good job of, okay, what are our laboratory experiments telling us? What are they showing us? What are we observing in situ? How can we blend those two together and then build models based off of that? These are models. They're not gonna be 100% accurate. No model is, but let's use the evidence that we have and not just create things fancifully. And then if we are going to go a step out so we can observe at his time is like we have probes in Earth's magnetosphere, which is a plasma environment just but in the near earth area, right? Okay, we can take that model of the magnetosphere and we'll do our best to apply it to the conditions that we do see beyond in interplanetary space. Then once we get probes there, we can refine our model with that new info. Well, we only have Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 outside the heliosphere. They're still in the transition zone. So anything basically outside our heliosphere is still just like, kind of a creation of our best understanding of conditions here. And that's where laboratory experiments come in. But he did a really good job of like building very solid footwork going from one to the next to the next, rather than just a big leap of, um, I don't even want to call it a leap of faith, just a big leap of this is what it is. 
Um, so you lay that out very nicely. Uh, that really resonates with me. And, and we do, we do see these things also through our telescope observations. So we do have some data and evidence, right? And we see these gamma ray bursts and we know that there's certain energy required for these things and how that scales off as it travels across time. So, uh, you put all that together and, um, just a recognition of plasma too. Like it requires us to think a little bit beyond gravity. We're in this, again, a lot of it's our thinking and in the history, like we're in this era of Newtonian physics and now we're in that transition to quantum physics, but people are aware of gravity. We interact with them on a day-to-day. We actually interact in terms of plasma day-to-day too. Like our biofields right now are overlapping. I could tune your biofield and start to manipulate the plasma that I just was training, trained in that a little bit. I'm not an expert, but, um, he, he just brought greater, one of these pioneers of greater awareness as to what plasma is, how it operates. And it's a greater awareness as to electromagnetism and how much more powerful of a force it is than gravity. Um, like, and, and plasma, just so people understand, is like you've got atoms and then the electrons are stripped off through a process called ionization, right? And so then the the electrons and the, the nucleus of the atom, so the protons and the neutrons, are kind of in this constant state of attraction and repulsion with, the, with those free um, uh, electrons, basically, right? So you've got the nucleus and now the free electrons that are constantly just kind of in this state of attraction and repulsion. And that's like, like lightning that you can see as a form of plasma or, um, is that basically how it works? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and it, it's really to also add another level of, uh, simplification to it as well. It's just, what's the default energy of a system? Cause if it's really, really low energy, like an energy void, then you have something that's near absolute zero. That's matter with strong crystalline bonds. And there's a, there's actually a lot of energy within that because you could split the atoms or whatever, but it's in this stable configure, the stable potential energy that doesn't really want to do much. Then you add energy in. Eventually, we'll use water as an example. So you have this ice cube floating in space that's near absolute zero. Then you add uh, heat to it, and eventually you get water. And then, of course, when we take pressure out of this equation or else it's going to be too crazy. But now you get water, then you get vapor, and then eventually that will ionize and split into hydrogen and oxygen. And so now you have these two floating around. Then you can even split the electrons off of the hydrogen and off the oxygen as you keep adding more and more energy into the system. So it's it's kind of just an energy equation. What's the energy density that's just inherent in that zone? My question is like, why is there like this energy density there? Like what's causing that spike to manifest and exist? And you can start to think about like, you know, do we get these waves of higher density energy just passing through our solar system or just naturally manifesting? Like how is that kind of manifesting out of the quantum field? And you could talk about David Bohm's work of the implicate in the explicate order and all these different things. We, we just don't really know, but... Plasma is this is very high energy density, and it still forms these ordered, coherent structures. Um, and the moment it has charge, it's now susceptible to the electromagnetic force, effectively, which is much stronger than gravity. And so gravity effectively becomes meaningless to something that has a charge. Uh, and this can be an ion. It can also be a dust grain. One of the things that Alvin talks about a lot is uh, just simply dust. Um, and you can have a dust grain that takes on a charge of a few volts. But what we often measure is that these dust grains have charges of like a thousand volts, 2000 volts, because the little dust grain, whatever it is, will attract ions to it. They'll typically will attract electrons and take on a negative charge, but if there's enough like ionization, like photo ionization, then that can cause those to scatter off and it'll accumulate positive charge. So now you have these also taking on different charges they're much bigger. They influence the electric field, the magnetic field, um, while they're also being guided by it. It gets very complicated very quickly, and you have this multi-body problem because instead of just tracking, for example, the two-body problem 
would be like Earth and the moon. How do they interact with each other gravitationally? Then you could add in a many body problem of, okay, well, we're going to add in Mars and Venus nearby and see how that interacts and subtly alters the orbit and things of, you know, Earth and the moon. But plasma inherently is like a crazy body problem because there's millions, billions, trillions of these things all interacting together simultaneously. So it's super, super fluid. So that's, I think, one limitation why it's not more well known or mainstream because it's just so inherently difficult to to model. And we have a lot of math, but math isn't going to fully quantify it. At least it isn't right now. 